So thanks for having us back. Um, it's nice to get re-invited. It means we didn't do so poorly the first time around. Um, so my name is Lise Johnson, and I am most recently at Rocky Vista University, which is a very small medical school in Colorado. But I, until recently, worked at University of Washington, so I'm very happy to be back in the region enjoying some rain again. Um, so today we're going to be talking about our book. Um, and the first thing we want to talk about is why would we write a book about worries? So this is um, a picture of my daughter. Um, a couple of years ago. She's much more advanced these days. Um, but I think for me, I've always been kind of a worrier, a worry wart, um, any way you want to phrase it. I've always been stressed out about things. But this really accelerated as a problem for me when I had kids. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had this experience, but I realized when I had kids that there was like new categories of things that I had never even thought about that I needed to worry about all of a sudden. And as I would Google them, I would get a little stressed out because you get a thousand hits for anything that you could potentially be worried about. And um, it started to really become kind of a problem in my life that I was worrying about all of these things. And my husband said to me one day as I was freaking out about something trivial in retrospect um, that, you know, as a scientist, you could probably figure out what you need to worry about and what you don't. And I had this realization that that was actually true. And so I started um, to kind of investigate in a logical way the things that I thought were important to worry about and the things that I didn't think were important to worry about. And as I was in this process, I realized lots of other people are stressed out about lots of things as well. Um, and that kind of kicked off this process. And then um, I worked with Eric Chudler at the time, and he graciously agreed to work on the project with me. And that's kind of how we got started. But one of the things that I've noticed is that this is an extremely timely topic. Every time I tell someone, hey, I'm writing this book about worries, they always respond with, did you write a chapter on fill in the blank, right? Everybody has something that they're really worried about. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we um, discuss in the book, and then we're going to give some tips on how people can investigate worries on their own. But First, we want to talk about what our methods were. Um, so Eric and I are both scientists, and I would venture to say kind of nerdy scientists at that. And so we felt that we needed to have a process and some defining principles as we embarked on this project. So we thought about, well, what sorts of things should you reasonably be worried about? And we said there are really three things that are important to consider. The first is how likely is something to happen to you? Um, the second is, how bad is it going to be if it does, in fact, happen to you? And then finally, what can you do to prevent it from happening to you? And we decided, really, that if something is likely to happen to you, if it's going to be bad, and if you can do something about it, then that sort of forms this magic um, space of things that you should worry about. Everything else, if it's unlikely, you don't need to worry about it. If it's not really going to be a big deal, you don't need to worry about it. And if there's nothing you can do about it, even if it is really going to be a problem, then you don't really need to worry about that either, because there's nothing you can really do to prevent it. So it's kind of a waste of your time. So we quantified, quantified our worries in this way. So for each of our problems that we investigated, each of our topics that we investigated, we created what's called, what we call the worry index. So the worry index is really a very loose quantification. Okay? It's really based on we investigated this, we talked about it, and we scaled each of these worries with respect to each other. So it's not something to really take religiously to the bank. It's a good place to start. And so we're going to talk about um, how, we, how we feel about each of these topics. And hopefully, we'll have a chance for you guys to participate as well. So as an example, uh, we're going to talk about asteroid strikes. So that's one of the things that some people worry about. In fact, millions of years ago, the dinosaurs were maybe worrying about getting struck by an asteroid if they had a large enough brain to worry about things. Uh, but some people do worry about uh, maybe all life on Earth will be destroyed again. And so I'm going to give this as an example about the criteria that we use. And then we're going to give you some examples to do on your own. So for an asteroid strike, um, the likelihood of getting struck by a large asteroid is minuscule. So there are a couple sentry systems here in the United States and also in Europe that are scanning the skies for large objects on their way to Earth. 
And it's estimated that the next significant one within the next 100 years has almost a 99.9% .9 chance that it will miss Earth. So the likelihood of a large asteroid hitting the Earth is almost nil. Okay, so because it's unlikely, nothing to worry about. So you should be happy about that, very unlikely. Can you do anything to prevent it? So if there was an asteroid coming to Earth, is there some way that you can avert this disaster? So how many of you have seen, uh, what is it, uh, Am, uh, Armageddon with Ben Affleck and uh, Bruce Willis? Yeah, most of you have seen that one, right? Would that work? No, it's not gonna work. If you put a nuclear bomb on an asteroid, you just, instead of one asteroid coming down to Earth, you're gonna get maybe 101 and it will still be a big problem. Uh, we do not have any technology at this time to prevent an asteroid if it was coming toward us. Some technologies that are being thought of, well, maybe if you can break it up into tiny, tiny little pieces, maybe that would work because our atmosphere is being bombarded by asteroids all the time, but if they're small enough, they burn up in the atmosphere, it doesn't cause a problem. Uh, other technologies might be to send something up and rather than uh, break it apart, just nudge it a little bit off course, right? Because if you catch it soon enough, because the Earth is moving, all you have to do is change the trajectory a little bit and the Earth will move out of the way, right? So the, ast or the, so the asteroid won't hit. Another technology would be to put up a large object and gravitationally pull the asteroid away, again, to divert it off course, and that would also cause it to miss. Can we do that now? No. So we can't do anything to prevent it. So nothing to worry about. Now, if it did happen though, sorry, if it does happen, just like it happened millions of years ago, it would wipe out a lot of life on Earth, including all human life. Right? So the consequence is devastating, right? If something like that happened, all human life would probably be destroyed, right? So unfortunately. So when you add all these up together, this is where we would place it, on that lower left side. It's unlikely to happen, there's nothing you can do about it, although the consequence would be bad, but because of those two criteria, getting struck by an asteroid is nothing for you to worry about, okay? So those are the methods we use. We looked at the data of the likelihood, the consequence, and can you do anything to prevent it? Uh, so now uh, it's sort of audience participation time. So all of you should have uh, a piece of paper with a little uh, graph on it, a little uh, plot, and uh, your job is to assign a little dot. And the size of the dot is going to be the consequence. And you should be plotting it uh, on the two scales. So Lisa's going to introduce the first one. OK. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mercury. So everybody play along. It's after lunch. So everybody wake up. Participation is, is key. Um, I want you on your plot to make a bubble sort of relative to the size that you think it should be, and then also to, uh, oh yeah, exactly, Eric put up this nice plot. So put it in the quadrant that you think it belongs in, and then give it a size relative to the magnitude of the problem that you think it is. I'll give you just a minute to do that, and then um, we'll continue. Everybody has to play, commit. Okay. So raise your hand if you think that it belongs in this quadrant down here, unlikely, and you can't do anything to stop it. Excellent. How about unlikely and you can do something about it? Yes, excellent. Some people think so. Likely to happen, but you can't do anything about it. This is sort of the fatalistic category down here, a few. And how about up here? Likely to happen and you can do something about it, therefore you should worry. OK, some of you aren't playing, but that's fine. You'll get into it. <laughs> so here's where we put it, OK? So we actually put it up here in the worry category, and it gets a relatively large dot. So why is that? I kind of primed you in thinking about this by giving you a picture of a fish. So many people are thinking about methylmercury, which is um, part of our diet, and we worry about it in that sense. And that is a problem. But there's also another form of mercury that you might encounter, and that would be elemental mercury. So how many people have actually seen mercury in real life? 
Yeah, so it's very cool, right? My mom tells me stories about when she was a kid in science class, they would actually give her a blob of mercury to roll around in her hand, and it was, it was so exciting because it's silvery and it's neat, right? Everybody thinks it's neat, and people have thought that it's neat for thousands of years, actually. So historically, it's been used for medicinal purposes. It used to be a very common treatment for syphilis, for example. Um, it's been used for sort of magical or ritualistic purposes, and it still is. It's used in mining because it forms amalgams with both gold and silver. <coughs> Um, and it's used in fillings, right? Does anybody have silver fillings? You probably also, or gold fillings also. You also have some mercury in there because it forms an amalgam. Um, so the problem with mercury that in addition to being very cool, it's obviously also very toxic, right? Um, and mercury is most toxic not when you put it on your skin or even when you eat it, but when you inhale it. So elemental mercury is most dangerous when you inhale it, and which is strange because you don't think about a metal as being particularly vaporous, but mercury is a strange metal, right? And so um, it's most easily absorbed into your body if you inhale it and then it crosses into your blood and then it crosses into your brain and there are a number of negative side effects associated with that. So elemental mercury is very much to be avoided and we don't usually encounter it in commercial products anymore. Um, that used to be in thermometers but they've been highly phased out. Um, and you used to find it in um, science classes and fishing lures and all kinds of places. The problem is that even though we don't manufacture those products anymore, even though we don't distribute it to science classes for kids to play with in the palm of their hand, it still exists in a legacy form. Um, and once it is distributed in the environment, once you break a thermometer, once you spill mercury, it's very, very difficult and expensive to clean it up. You can't sweep it up, you can't vacuum it up, you can't just dump it down the drain because it persists. And there have been examples of children finding it in their science classrooms and taking it home and playing with it, and they have to take their houses literally down to the studs in order to decontaminate the house. Right? There has been an example of somebody who broke a mercury thermometer 20 years prior in their home, and they were still recording measurable levels of mercury vapor in the in the, in the room, in the bathroom. Um, so that can obviously be very problematic. Methylmercury, which we're familiar with in, the term, in terms of fish, um, is also a problem, but it's hard to say how big of a problem it is. And there's lots of confounders. So clearly, having too much methylmercury is toxic. Um, and we know that because of an unfortunate incident in Minamata, Japan, um, a number of years ago. Um, but it's sort of the in-between levels are harder to quantify because there are so many individual differences and because consuming fish, which is sort of the largest um, source of methylmercury, is also really good for you in lots of other ways. So it's kind of this strange balance between fish is really good for you and your cognitive development, but mercury is really bad for you in your cognitive development. So how do we find the, the happy medium between those two things? And I think it's fair to say that scientists are still arguing about that. But um, one thing we can say is that fish that are higher up on the food chain, which usually means the big ones, right, that eat the littler ones, are going to have more concentration of methylmercury than ones that are lower on the food chain, which means if you eat sardines, you're going to get less mercury than if you're eating shark or swordfish, for example. So most experts recommend now that you should try and eat fish, but you should eat fish that are lower on the food chain and fish that are higher in omega fatty acids. So this one gets a, a frowny face, yeah. Question, how do you think about the scale on the x-axis? Is this a percentage chance of encountering it in your lifetime? Repeat the question. Oh, to repeat the question, sorry. So how do we scale it on the x-axis? Is it at sort of a lifetime risk? I tend to think of it as more of like a snapshot in time. So at this point in time, if you, assuming that you have any exposure at all, like you are eating fish or you are living in a world where there is elemental mercury, what is your likelihood? So it's a little bit personalized, right? Not everybody's gonna have the same level of exposure, which is one of the reasons why we ask people not to read sort of too much into our worry index, but really to think about how this might apply to you. All right, your next worry is in honor of uh, Brain Awareness Week, which is actually an international event going on next week, is your brain eating amoeba. Uh, and this was actually something that was in the newspaper uh, just very recently. Uh, there was a case in uh, Washington, and so you may have seen the headlines in the Seattle Times and on the news. So uh, again, on your sheets of paper, where would this worry be? Pick which quadrant it should be. 
And again, just to help you out, looks like most people are finished. So raise your hand if this is a concern of yours that it's unlikely to happen and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Unlikely to happen, but there's nothing you can do to stop it. How about uh, the above that? It's unlikely to happen, but there is something you can do about it. Maybe a few more people. How about it's very likely to happen to you, uh, and you can, uh, uh, it's likely to happen, and you can't do anything about it. So it's likely to happen that the bottom right-hand side. And how about just above that, this is something that you should worry about. All right. This is where we placed it. Uh, it's something that is very unlikely to happen. There is something that you can do about it, but it has a large circle because if it happens to you, it's 97% fatal. Okay, so what is a brain eating amoeba? It's a small, single-celled organism that is found in warm, fresh water. Uh, if it's in, uh, inhaled through your nose, in many, not in many cases, in a few cases, it gets into the upper part of your nose where it uh, then crawls, I guess if an amoeba crawls, uh, through the sinuses up to your brain where it starts eating brain tissue. And that's bad, as you might imagine. Uh, but it's very unlikely to happen. Many waters uh, are contaminated with this amoeba, but very few people come down with it. In fact, for the last about 30 years or so, there's only been about 150 cases or so. So it's very unlikely to happen, even though a lot of water is contaminated. Uh, you can also not contract the uh, disease by swallowing the water. It must go into your nasal passages. So just because you swallow the water, the amoeba is killed in your digestive system. Um, the other way you can get it, if, you don't, if you're not in this fresh water in like a spa or something like that, uh, there's a device called a neti pot. So some people use a neti pot to clean out their sinuses. You're supposed to use purified or sterilized water. And then you kind of tip the pot into your nose to clean your sinuses. Well, if that water is contaminated, then the amoeba can get up in your nose and it can then crawl into your brain and, I'm sorry to say, kill you. Uh, so, uh, again, not something to worry about. But the headlines make it as if it is something that you should worry about. The Seattle Times had a big headline, you know, brain-eating amoeba, doctor says it can happen to you, right? But very, very unlikely, even though it's a somewhat common bacteria. So, nothing to worry about. Uh, the next one. Okay, so flame retardants. First of all, does everybody know what I mean when I talk about flame retardants? These are chemicals that are added a lot of times to furniture, most commonly furniture, also baby toys and bouncers and stuff, and carpets and car seats um, in order, obviously, to stop them from catching on fire. So now that you know what they are, write down quickly what you think. Yeah? Does asbestos count? No. That, that's a separate chapter. Different chapter, yeah. Are we talking about the risk of being injured by flame retardants or injured by the lack of flame retardants? Um, of being injured by flame retardants, yeah. So here's our, just to remind you, here's our plot. So put it in one of these quadrants. Although that's an interesting question about whether it's being injured by or the lack of. Both obviously could be a problem. But in this case, we're talking about the chemicals. Okay, so. Who thinks we belong down here? Not really a problem. OK. How about up here? A few as well. So that would be in the unlikely, and you can do something about it. So it's highly preventable, but not highly likely. How about it's likely to happen, but you can't really do anything about it, so don't worry about it up there. And how many think it's something to worry about? Okay, so I'll tell you that this is the, this is the topic that sent me kind of over the edge. Um, I was worried about flame retardants in our sofa, and I actually made my husband take our sofa out to the garage, and we lived without a sofa for several months. Um, and I'll tell you why. So before I do, let me, let me show you where we assigned it and explain a little bit about this plot. Okay, so first of all, this circle right here is, it looks like it's slightly off to the left, but it's meant to be um, centered right on the 50% line, and it's about 50% size. Um, and that means, actually, when I give something a score of 50-50, it means I have no idea. Okay, so this is, this is what I like to call in the zone of uncertainty. 
All right? And the reason for that is because when we're talking about flame retardant chemicals, there are thousands of different chemicals that are out there in the wild that are being used. And most of them have actually not been rigorously studied for their effects on human health. So a little bit of history on flame retardants. Um, they were originally added to furniture by law in the state of California around, oh, I'm gonna get my date wrong, I think it was 1975, um, because there's a problem with people smoking and when they um, fall asleep with a cigarette in their mouth or close by, they would um, light their furniture on fire. And in order to get around this problem, um, the state of California mandated that furniture meet a certain flame resistant standard. And the way that manufacturers achieved this standard was by adding flame retardant chemicals. Um, and because California is such a huge market, most manufacturers didn't make furniture for the rest of the world and furniture for California, they just added flame retardant chemicals to everything. So the problem is that many of these chemicals are associated with all kinds of health problems. So endocrine problems and um, developmental problems, growth problems, cancer obviously is always on the list. But they haven't really been, you know, the whole sum of them haven't been rigorously tested. Um, and so we still don't really know how big of a problem they are. We know that they are persistent environmental pollutants. So you can isolate them in, a, in the fat of Arctic polar bears, which turns out to be like the gold standard for a persistent environmental pollutant. If you can find it in a polar bear, then um, we have a problem, right? Um, and, and they're basically everywhere in the environment, which is why we get a pretty low preventability score, right? They're in your car, they're in your house, they're any place that has um, foam in particular is often treated with flame retardant chemicals. So recently, about 2013, the state of California reversed its uh, technical bulletin. It's called Technical Bulletin 117, and now there's an amendment in 2013 saying you don't have to have um, the same sort of flame retardant properties in your furniture. And so now it is legal to make furniture that doesn't have added flame retardants, and some manufacturers do. So you can find a sofa, Ikea makes them, which is where we got our, our non-flame retardant sofa is from Ikea, um, and you can buy baby products that also don't have flame retardants added to them, okay? It's probably worth doing, in my opinion, just because of the level of uncertainty. But I can't say for sure that this is going to hurt you or not hurt you because the data is really not in on that. Does that, make, does that sort of make sense as to why it ends up in this particular zone of uncertainty. The other thing that sort of surrounds this issue, and it gets back to his question over here about whether we should be concerned about not having flame retardants. So is there a problem with your furniture catching on fire? And the answer is probably yes, right? Like we build our furniture and many of the things that are in our house out of incredibly flammable materials. And foam in particular goes up really fast, it burns really hot, and it produces lots of really toxic smoke. So um, that's obviously not ideal. It turns out that in tests done by the um, Consumer Product Safety Division, uh, sofas that were treated with flame retardants didn't actually burn um, any less quickly, any less hot, and they were a little bit more toxic because of the added flame retardants, right? So it's not that we don't have a problem with our furniture catching on fire. It's less of a problem now because fewer people smoke in bed or in their couches or whatever. Um, but we do have incredibly flammable furniture. It's just that the flame retardants don't really help with that problem. So good news and bad news there. So now, as I promised you, we're going to talk about some tips for doing it yourself, right? So um, the first thing I'll say is that when we started on this project, at least I thought that it was going to be much easier to do than it turned out to be. Because I thought, well, I have a PhD, and I know how to read a paper. I'll just go to the literature, and I will read papers, and I will decide. And it turned out to be really hard to do, partly because it's really hard to identify good sources in a field that is not your own field, right? So we had to spend some time thinking about how we really were going to identify good sources, incredible sources, and then come and sort of condense the information. So we came up with a tip sheet, which we've actually included in the appendix of the book, and I'm going to give it to you for free right here, all my secrets right now. So the first thing that I would suggest is first to identify your priorities, the things that you would like to worry about. And that's because, you know, we created this worry index um, 
But it's based on what we think is worth worrying about, not necessarily what everybody else thinks is worth worrying about. And everybody is different, everybody's individual, so you have to make your own um, sort of priorities before you even start, because otherwise you can dig yourself into a very deep hole very quickly. Okay? The second point is to use credible sources. And this is the part where I really see people going wrong quickly. I have seen many, many poorly informed people on the internet spreading their ideas. Okay? And it's not always intentional. I think people, there's a lot of misunderstanding. But you don't want to take somebody's misunderstanding and use it as the guide for your life. Right? And that means that you need to seek out expertise. And we live in a time right now where expertise is perhaps a little undervalued. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I think that um, when people spend all of their time and effort learning about something, they probably have something useful to say about it. And we should seek out those people when we're trying to make our decisions. Anybody can have an opinion, but not everybody's opinion is equally valid. Okay. Um, the other thing that I would say is to read laterally, which is a new term to me, so I'll just define it. You might already be completely familiar with it. So the idea is that, especially on the internet, if you're reading vertically, you're starting at the top and you're reading down to the bottom, right? And that doesn't always give you as much information about that source as you would like. So to read laterally, what you do is you actually open a new tab and then you search for the source that you're looking at and see what other people have to say about it. Right? Because the internet being what it is, there will probably be other people who have thought about what that source is and whether or not it's a reliable source. And so whenever you're deciding whether you should believe what you read, you should think about who it is that's telling you that, why they're telling you that, what their um, credentials are for telling you that, what their biases are behind that. We usually recommend that people start with government agencies. And people don't like to hear, start with a government agency, right? But let me just say this. The government funds science out of public funds, which means that the requirements for transparency are very high. Okay? Grants are reviewed by other scientists. Papers are reviewed by other scientists. Governments, um, government labs that do research have to post their data and make their methods available. Okay? That is not the case for private think tanks. And it may not be clear where their money is coming from, why they're giving you that information, so think what you may about government agencies, but it's at least a very good place to start. So I always like the National Institutes of Health. There are multiple institutes of health. They often produce fact sheets, which are very helpful. The Centers for Disease Control, um, the World Health Organization, while not being truly a governmental agency, is also a very reliable source. And the FDA as well, OK? Seek out expertise, and then look for consensus in the field. So I say this because um, I actually teach at a medical school, and I have my students review scientific papers for me. Um, and I always have a student that reviews a paper about the dangers of vaccines. Okay, And here's my point about that. Vaccines aren't covered in the book, first of all. So <laughs> my point about that is, yes, you can always find some scientific literature that will review the risks. And it's not that there aren't any risks, and it's not that those things aren't worth investigating, but you need to look at the entire body of literature surrounding any topic before you make a decision. Okay? There are lots of different opinions in science, and that's good. There should be lots of different opinions. But when you're trying to figure out sort of the global truth about a topic, what everybody thinks is going to settle closer to the truth than what any individual thinks. So it's important to think about what everybody is saying, not just what one paper says. One paper is never enough to make a decision about anything. Um, and then finally, or not finally, <laughs> I have more. Next, um, I would say understand probabilities, at least a little bit, OK? Because scientists like to speak in probabilities, which can be very frustrating for people. They want to know, will this give me cancer or not, right? But that's not how life works, because everything is multifactorial. So everything has a probability or a chance of impacting anything happening to you. And a scientist will very rarely say, if you eat this, you will die of cancer, right? They will say, this will increase your risk of dying of cancer, OK? So think about what that means, really, how it applies to you, how it applies to your particular risk category, right? Because not everything is going to apply to everybody in the same way. 
I would say be skeptical. And this is a skill that we maybe have lost a little bit, right? It's important <coughs> for somebody to convince you of why what they're saying is true, right? First, when you hear something, when somebody says to you, you should definitely panic about this right now, your first instinct should be, why? Why should I panic about that right now? And if you give me a good reason, then maybe I will panic about it, right? Um, and then, actually, my last point is, I would say don't panic about it. And that's, that's easier said than done, even for me, right? I can stand here and say, don't panic about it, and then I'll go home and have a little minor freak out about something, right? But for me, and I think for everybody, it can help to make an action plan, right? And do something about the things that you can do something about and stop worrying about the things that you can't do anything about. I'm not the first person to have said that. I'm just suggesting that you apply a logical and rigorous method to thinking about the things that you want to worry about. Would you like to add anything, Dr. Jetley? No. No. <laughs> OK. Um, so at this point, we have a couple minutes. So we could go through a couple more examples, or we could go to questions. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering if you have anything to say about um, the disconnect between what you may logically understand is something not to be worried about, but um, subconsciously or um, against your logic, you are worrying about it anyway. And I think for a lot of people, it's probably the size of the bubble um, is a indicator of how much they'll worry about it, regardless of where it is on that plot. So do you have any techniques for how to let your logical thinking sort of overcome the worry? Well, I can tell you it works for me, but I don't know that that would work for everybody. And Eric probably has a comment on that as well, although I don't think he worries in general as much as I worry about things. Um, so for me, this process actually really helps to go through and look at what the evidence is and then to make a conscious decision and then remind myself every now and then, like, I already decided I'm not going to worry about flame retardants because I can't do anything more about it. Um, you know, but. That doesn't, that's not always enough for everybody, especially if you tend to be a higher anxiety person. And there are other techniques, obviously, for just dealing with stress, like exercise is really good at reducing people's stress level, or meditating, or praying, or you know, a lot of other techniques. The world is a stressful place, and like, there's no way that you're going to eliminate all of the things that could potentially kill you or hurt you. Um, so in, in some sense, you have, to, you have to come to grips with that in whatever way you can. So this can help to some extent, but maybe not all the way, is what I would say. Yeah, and, and you might think to yourself, well, why would someone have worry about a particular thing if their really logic doesn't point that direction? And I think part of that reason is because some of these things that happen rarely, for example, shark attacks, right? Some people are afraid of getting eaten by a shark. How, how many people do you think uh, a year get killed by sharks? So I'll just throw out some numbers. 105 in the entire world. How many people do you think get attacked, an unprovoked shark attack in the world? What number? No, not killed, just attacked, bit, bitten by a shark. How many? Throw out some numbers. 50, 10. Yeah, so now you're, you're kind of going down now. But it's, about, it's, about, it's, less, it's, less, it's, less, it's less than 100 in the entire world. And think of all the millions of people that swim in the ocean. Yet people are afraid of shark attack, right? Well, it's because when a shark attack does happen, it's horrific, right? So the, every time a, surfer's, a surfboard gets chomped by a shark, it's in the news. Right? And so the media plays up these things and plays on people's fears. And so that might cause some illogical fears and worries in people. But when you look at the real data, a lot of these things are nothing to, to worry about. Hi. Hi. You mentioned that uh, when I do research, I should look at the entire body of science to scientific literature, not just read one piece. But I think historically, a lot of things have been breakthroughs because they were in the minority or unique. For example, Darwin, Galileo, I mean, it's, and these people have historically always been persecuted. So I guess my question is, like nowadays, the people who are into uh, anti-vax probably feel that way, right? And I can't convince them they're wrong. And I'm wondering how do I interact with people who feel this way? I feel like we have multiple questions in there, so let me see if I can unpack them a little bit. So first is the point about science has always been, you know, the minority is pushing it forward. I, don't, I think that that's actually an exception rather than a rule. Mm -hmm. So it's notable 
when it happens, because it happens rarely, not all the time, right? Um, so yes, it does sometimes happen. So you have to acknowledge that sometimes, you know, everybody thinks there's an ether and there's not, right? Um, but often, science moves forward through lots of small steps and a group of people pushing something forward, right? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, you're right, you will never convince somebody against their will, right? If people have, you know, people don't want to be wrong. So <laughs> you, there's only so much you can do. And I think um, in some ways you have to just be at peace with that, right? Like you can't convince everybody all the time, but you can only do what you can do about yourself and make choices for yourself and make choices for your family. And that's um, at least my opinion on how to interact with people. Um, I still try, I'm a, I'm a huge sort of science advocate and advocate for logical thinking and for looking at data. Um, you know, the day that our book was released, I got um, an angry email from somebody about fluoride, right? And there, you know, I can't, I can't change that person's mind. It doesn't matter how much data I show them, how much data people research, that if you don't want to believe it, you don't. A quick follow-up, if you don't mind. You said you can't change how other people are, but you also said that you're like, you advocate th scientific thinking. I imagine you want to pass this on to your children, uh, your spouse. And my question is, how do I help my partner ask, uh, how do I help my partner worry less? And I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> right. So your friend's partner. Um, it depends on your friend's partner, really. Um, so I guess um, I, would, I would try and stay away from being judgy. Right. So if you come to somebody with an open mindset and an openness to talk about things, you're going to get a lot farther than if you um, come out of the gate swinging, is what I would say. Maybe you have yeah. some. No, no. And I, I think it's a lost skill that perhaps uh, we may not be able to change uh, adults thinking, but trying to culture critical thinking skills in children and, and young students. Uh, perhaps that's one way we can combat some of this, these falsehoods that we know about. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for speaking. Um, I was wondering how like preventability interacts with things that are like as a group preventable, but as an individual you can do very little about. Like climate change is an example that individually we can almost do nothing, but yeah, would be addressable if, if there were a group action. So uh, in the book, we really only thought about things you can do personally to prevent. Um, obviously, corporate action is a much more difficult problem. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have any great answers for that. I think like vote is obviously a big one, um, but not perfect. And um, you know, community organization and a number of other things. It's, I, that's a tough nut. I don't yeah, know. That, I that's the it. only thing, yeah, that's the only thing that I thought of is voting for the types of things that you think uh, people should be doing, Yeah. You know? vote. Um, so my question might be a little bit related. I've noticed there are certain cases where our worries, even though they are on the unlikely side, the fact that we worry changes it. So makes it unlikely. Let me give an example. Let's say turning America into dictatorship, theocracy, anything else that it's not today. It's not happening and the priority is low because we worry about it all the time because we kind of do something about it. So it, it's low, right? If you look at the probability, it's low. The impact is high. But it's low because of our worries. What do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, so I, yeah, I mean, when I see students that are about to defend their dissertations and they're really stressed out about it, I'm like, I'm not worried about you because you're worried about it. And you know, if you weren't <laughs> worried about it, then I would be worried. And I, I, think, I think that's sort of a similar situation. Um, but I, I actually think that that means that, that it is high on the preventability scale, right? True. That it doesn't happen because it is preventable and we take action against it and that prevents it from happening. Yeah, but it's low on the probability. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's unlikely to happen because it's highly preventable, I, I guess is what I would say. And, and, and that's actually interesting. Perhaps that's a, a new chapter for the book and that would be, should you worry about worrying? <laughs> and the answer is probably yes, because worrying does have physiological effects. It could reduce your sleep, it can cause stress, which cause other physiological problems. So worrying about worrying is probably something that we should worry about. <laughs> Thank you. Or do something about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think that 
You mentioned about the um, government organizations, but you know we have some examples like Flint. You know, crisis where uh, they were untruthful. So how do you um, look critically at government sources as well? So I guess. First of all, I would distinguish between different kinds of government organizations. So when I'm talking about government organizations, I'm talking about research-based government organizations, um, not necessarily city or government officials that are enacting policy. I think that's, that's slightly different. Um, but again, so I think government fact sheets um, are good places to start. And in some cases, I think they're good places to finish as well. But if it's something that you're concerned about, then there are other resources. And um, you know, there's other governments with other, other fact sheets, right? So that works as well. So like the National Health Service in the UK produces their own set of fact sheets, and you can compare. But then you can also go to the primary literature. And I think I try and caution people when they do that, because the, the chances of misinterpretation, if you're not part of that field, can be pretty high. Um, but that's always an option that's out there. There are online databases, so Google Scholar is the one that I always use, but there's also PubMed. Um, and you can look there for primary information and seek out those sources and read them for yourself. How do you guys factor in like return on investment for preventability? Say something's very preventable, but I'd have to sell my home and move to Alaska? I know. <laughs> I mean, so I think that also, that, so you, that's where, why it's like a three-dimensional problem, right? So it's very preventable, but it's very unlikely. Probably don't sell your house and move to Alaska, right? Um, you're increasing your odds of getting eaten by a polar bear, so you have to like really factor that in as you're making that decision. Um, and also the size of the risk and just prioritizing, is it really that important to me that it's worth making a major lifestyle change? And I think that's kind of what it comes down to is get all of the data and then say, well, what's it, what's it worth to me? And is it worth the cost? Is it really just a very small marginal return? Or is it going to make a huge difference in my quality of life? And nobody can make that decision for you. You've got you to do your own thing. Well, thank you very much for coming to talk to us today.